Welcome to worship at Pioneer Congregational United Church of Christ. Whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Our call to worship. Let us praise God for the mighty deeds brought in Jesus Christ. Praise God for loosening the chains of sin. Praise God for breaking the bonds of death. Praise God for releasing the forces of love. Come with God's people throughout the earth. Let us praise the risen Christ. research for today's children's message, I have learned that while some Christians refer to today as the second Sunday of Easter, depending on where someone is geographically, whether they're in the eastern or western part of the world, or what branch of Christianity is followed, such as Catholicism or Protestantism, or maybe your Greek Orthodox, it may have a different name. Depending on where someone is or what type of church they belong to, today may also be referred to as Thomas Sunday, New Sunday, Divine Mercy Sunday, Low Sunday, and even Quasimodo Sunday. You can do some additional research about why all of these different names exist on your own, and I would encourage you and your learning partner to do so. I find that the more I know about something, the more I realize how much I don't know, which encourages me to then learn even more. 
And sometimes this is called going down the rabbit hole, which is a reference to a story called Alice in Wonderland. In this story, the main character, Alice, fell down a rabbit hole and her adventures took her many places within that rabbit warren. While she was down there, she met many other characters and learned new perspectives about things she thought she already knew, such as cats, tea parties, and games such as croquet, and more. When I was reading the words in the call to worship, I thought about some of these words. They're big words because they're big concepts. Words like sin and death and love, and how those words can mean different things to different people. I mentioned the different names for the first Sunday after Easter to show that the same event can mean something different, depending on not only the person who is experiencing the event, but the different time periods that they are experiencing it. In my opinion, the definition of the word sin and some of its examples can be different for different people. One definition of the word sin is that it's bad stuff we do that makes God sad and separates us from our creator. Talk to your learning partner and share with them something that you would consider bad stuff. It doesn't have to be something that you've done, just something that you think might be bad. Did you mention lying? How about disobeying or arguing or maybe taking something that's not yours? These are some of the behaviors that many people would consider bad and would call a sin. You may have thought of some things that I didn't mention because each of us is different. Death is also something that means different things to different people. No one knows for sure what happens after people and animals die. So that's why there are different ideas about death. Again, because we are all different people. One of the stories in the Bible that comes from the time after Easter is that Thomas, who was one of the disciples, didn't believe that Jesus had been resurrected because he, Thomas, hadn't seen Jesus for himself. When Jesus revealed himself to Thomas, Thomas was very happy and said, my Lord, my God. But then Jesus wondered out loud why Thomas only believes now that Thomas had seen him and not when others had told them about Jesus returning. Jesus wants us all to know that no matter what, even though we can't see spirit, the creator is with us. We don't have to see something something to know that it's there, to feel its presence, and we are blessed when we have not seen something, yet still believe that it is true. We can feel the wind, even though we can't see it, yes? And we can feel a cat purr, even though we can't see what's making the noise. We can feel when our family and our friends care about us, even though we don't always get to see them, and hug them, such as when they send us letters or funny memes or maybe send an email or call us. These are all types of love, the forces of love that were released when Jesus died. If you've ever done something that you thought was bad, was there a feeling or emotion that you had either while you were doing it or maybe just after you did it? that made you uncomfortable, made you not want to admit what you did. Maybe you thought you would get in trouble if you confessed or told someone. I believe that's the feeling that is referred to when we talk about being separated from the creator. It can be said that we feel down or are in a dark mood. Some can use the word depressed. Maybe we believe that others will not like us or not believe us when we apologize or try to say that we're sorry. 
These feelings are what I think of when I hear the phrase, the chains of sin. We are weighing ourselves down with these feelings and it becomes difficult to get away from the negative thoughts. When we have these thoughts and feelings, that's when it's especially important to reach out to our learning partners, our family members, our friends, and ask for help to break those bonds that are holding us down. They can help us to see the light and release the forces of love that they have for us and we need to have for ourselves. And this is the message of hope that comes from the Easter story. We are the light that shines out to others and others are there to help our light shine even when we don't see it ourselves. Let us pray. Breathe within, within us, O God, your Holy Spirit, to open minds, to unlock hearts, to enliven faith, to bring belief, so we may welcome the risen Christ among us. Amen. Our first lesson is from 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The unknown author of the first letter of John instructs the church on the message of hope found in the light of Christ. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testify to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not know what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the Righteous and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of God.
The second lesson today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. Following the resurrection, the disciples except Thomas see Jesus. On the following Sunday, Jesus reveals the meaning of faith. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where their disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed him his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to, the, to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When we say, I believe, it can mean two very different things. As usually stated, I believe means I think something is true. For, for example, I believe the California quail is our state bird. That belief is based on being taught that as a child while studying California history at Parkmont Elementary School in Fremont. I can check that belief by going on Wikipedia, uh, looking at the page, list of U.S. state birds and scrolling down to California where it says California quail, Calipepla californica, 
And there's a picture of a quail and a note. It was so designated in 1931. So my belief is confirmed if you believe that Wikipedia is reliable, which in this case, I think you can. I've seen many California quail around Sacramento and Yolo counties. I'm not sure it represents our state any better than the California condor or the California gull would, but it's an interesting bird, and I have no reason not to believe that the California quail can represent the golden state as well as the California gull represents the state of Utah. Uh, the California gull is Utah's state bird because a flock of gulls saved the crops of the Latter-day Saints during a grasshopper invasion. Well, gulls are messy, squawky birds, so Utah can have our gull and we'll keep our quail. There's no trust in this use of I believe, other than trusting that my teachers and Wikipedia weren't part of some conspiracy to hide the fact that the real state bird is something other than the quail. The story of the Apostle Thomas, which we read every year on the Sunday after Easter, uses a second meaning of the phrase, I believe. Martin Luther defined belief as that on which you set your heart and put your trust. This is different from knowing a fact and believing that it is true. This use of I believe is the faith that tells your heart that something is true. Now, faith is more than simply choosing to believe that something you want to be true is true. Faith means setting your heart on something, putting your trust in someone. There's a curious thing uh, in last week's gospel lesson that's always troubled me. After Mary Magdalene has found the empty tomb, she runs to where the disciples are hiding. Peter and the unnamed disciple who Jesus loved run and reach the empty tomb, and John reports this. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. The disciple saw and believed, John writes. But he believed what? John knows the disciples don't understand that Jesus has to rise from the dead. So what is the I believe of this disciple? I guess it's, I believe Jesus is gone. This only becomes belief that Jesus is raised when he appears that night to the disciples as they huddle in fear behind locked doors. Well, I'm sure you know the story of Doubting Thomas. For, for some reason, he's not with the other ten disciples on Easter evening when the risen Christ comes to them. Uh, this means they have something that he doesn't. Instead of sharing their experience of Jesus, all Thomas has is their word of what they have seen. And that simply isn't enough for him. Thomas never doubts Jesus. He simply doubts his kindred disciples. The problem isn't really Thomas, the problem is the credibility of the others. The ten have seen the risen Jesus, they've been given his peace. The other disciples have had his spirit breathed on them. They are commissioned by Jesus to continue his work in the world. Well, later the disciples inform Thomas that they have seen Jesus, but he refuses to believe unless he sees the wounds in Jesus' hands and his side. Indeed, he refuses to believe unless he can touch those wounds and feel that they're real. Most sermons about Doubting Thomas point that when Jesus stands before him the next Sunday, he quickly sheds his doubt and becomes Believing Thomas. A number of years ago, I even titled a sermon for this Sunday after Easter as Believing Thomas. Thomas's belief begins as the first type of belief I mentioned. He has a sudden gasp of recognition. He can see with his own eyes what he had previously been told. Yes, Jesus has come back from being in the tomb. The report of the other disciples is confirmed. 
Note that Thomas does not seek Jesus out. Now, I may have checked Wikipedia to make sure I wasn't misremembering that the California quail is our state bird. <clears throat> I may have even gained two pieces of information to bolster that belief. And those were the quail's Latin name and the date it was adopted as our state bird. But Thomas does no checking to see if the disciples are correct. He just goes about his business. And then Jesus comes to him. Jesus walks past locked doors and seeks out the skeptic who no one else can convince. Jesus refuses to let anything block being this block bringing this doubter to belief, whether it be a closed door or a closed mind. And this triggers the second kind of belief. Thomas announces that Jesus is my Lord and my God. His I believe turns from, oh yes, I, I believe you are right, Jesus is not in the tomb, to I now believe Jesus is more than he was when he was with us before. When Thomas sees the risen Christ and makes his I believe statement of faith, it's a reflection that Thomas's life is now forever changed. In Jesus standing there, bearing his wounds, giving a word of peace, Thomas sees his Lord and his God, the one in whom he can now put his full trust. He doesn't need physically to touch Jesus's wounds because Thomas now believes that Jesus has touched his heart. And he can go out to spread the good news to others. The heart of the story of doubting Thomas is not about doubt, Thomas's or anyone else's. It's about God's call to us to witness to the resurrection. The message of this resurrection story is that Jesus comes to us as he came to Thomas. God seeks us out through whatever walls we have erected around us, offering us love when we, what we hear from unreliable friends and family sound like mere ghost stories. When we may be looking for concrete facts, God reaches out and says, trust, and believe and have faith. In every season of our lives, God seeks us out. Yet it may be as difficult for us to see this as it was for Thomas to recognize that God is right there in front of his face. It may be as hard for us to grasp as it was when Mary Magdalene thought that Jesus was the gardener we may not recognize God's presence. It, it may be hidden from our eyes as we look for some solid sign. Instead, God may come in the fiery words of a preacher or the loving hug of a grandmother. God's presence may be felt in the smile of a humble street person or a remark by some famous celebrity. But whatever the guise they come in, the message of Christ's peace and God's presence can change our life forever. We believe not because we have seen Jesus' wounds or were able to place our hands in his side, but because we have seen the face of Christ in the face of others. Their lives live out the presence of Christ for you as your life can live out Christ's presence for another. Jesus tells Thomas, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. The reason we reread the story of Thomas each year is to remind ourselves that belief is more than seeing. Belief is more than accepting facts. Belief is living out the good news of Christ's resurrection. May each of us find where we are in this story of faith, so that like Thomas, 
we can find that believing is seeing. Alleluia and amen. May God now touch our hearts in a time of prayer. Living God, giver of life, pour out your blessing on us and give us your spirit of peace. We pray for the church. May we be a living sign of the woundedness and healing of the risen Christ. Guide us to share his gift of forgiveness. Be with each of us as we spread the good news of reconciliation. As we look forward to reopening our doors, show us how to be more faithful stewards of the gifts that you have bestowed on us. We pray for the earth. Help us to see the scars that we have inflicted on your good creation. Make us bearers of the blessings of life that you offer all creatures. We pray for all nations. Show us how good and pleasant it is when people live in unity. Anoint us with your wisdom so we may seek the ways of life. Calm the tensions that mark our relationships around the globe, that we may work together to solve the myriad problems facing humanity. We pray for this community. Give us a vision of the common good. Move us past clinging to our own possessions so we can work together to bring fullness of life for all as a testimony to Christ's resurrection. Help us to work together to end the scourge of COVID-19, allowing life to return to our city, our county, our state, our nation, our world. We pray for loved ones. Be near to all who walk in the shadows of grief and pain. Lead them into Christ's light. Let them see the risen Christ standing with them in the faces of others. Bless those who mourn. Heal those who are ill. Guide those who are lost. And hear us now as we pray silently for those we know in need of Christ's presence. By the blessing of your spirit, help us to live out our prayers so the world may come to know the gift of life in Jesus Christ, our risen Savior, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Again, good morning. A reminder 
we have fellowship hour each Sunday at 11.30 a.m. via Zoom. You should have received the link in the weekly email. If you did not receive the link or would like to be invited, please write to the email you see on your screen. There will be a social justice committee meeting today at 12.30, immediately after the fellowship time in the same Zoom space. All those interested are encouraged to attend. Next Sunday, April 18th, there will be a church council meeting after the fellowship hour. During this time of COVID, some of our rooms have become storage areas or items that belong in other places or not at all. There's still a lot that needs to be accomplished, but we have a good start. Marietta and Bernadette will be at the church for the next three Thursdays starting at 10 a.m. cleaning and organizing. For more info, send an email to Bernadette at the address on your screen. Feel free to come and help them. And finally, we thank you for your constant faithful support of Pioneer Church during this time. The daily ministries of the church go on, and we thank you for your continuing support in tithes and offerings.
Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Let us go to share the good news that Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.